I'm Yogesh Kudwa. I'm an endocrinologist at Mayo Clinic Rochester, and I'm excited to be here today with uh, Dr. Rajapopalan, who's a PhD immunologist here at uh, uh, our institution, and Professor Joe Murray, who is an expert on celiac disease. Uh, my interest is mainly type 1 diabetes. I, I think we all know that diabetes has uh, reached epidemic proportions in the world. That is mostly type 2 diabetes, which is uh, linked to um, lifestyle. But what is equally important to note is that type 1 diabetes has also increased in, in incidence and it keeps on increasing every year. Type 1 diabetes is uh, classically diagnosed in childhood and uh, but can occur throughout life. Um, the diabetes is severe because such patients don't make any insulin. And it's very important to try and understand why this type of diabetes develops and also uh, to try and change what happens once patients develop this type of diabetes. So in, in this quest, there are certain interesting lessons we can learn from patients. And to address this further with research, uh, this collaboration with Dr. Raj Gopalan and, and Dr. Murray arose several years ago. And uh, we've got some very interesting uh, recent data based on laboratory experiments that we are going to talk more about today and ultimately relate all this back to our patients. So we look forward to comments from Dr. Raj Gopalan and and Dr. Marisu. So our interest in this, or the reason for the collaboration, is we, as clinicians, doctors looking after patients, we started to recognize that there was an association between type 1 diabetes and celiac disease. They tend to flock together. They've got some similarities in that they seem to have some of the same genetic predisposition to both conditions. And about 5 to 6 percent of people with type 1 diabetes will get celiac disease. Early on, we thought maybe celiac disease might be triggering the type 1 diabetes, but it doesn't look like that. It looks like these are two conditions that occur in similar people, even sometimes in the same families. They seem to have strong association with genetics. For both disorders, we also appreciate there's a strong environmental influence. For celiac disease, we know the major influence is gluten. We don't know the major environmental influences for type 1 diabetes. But there's been some very interesting work in infants suggesting that some of the similar factors in infancy might trigger both diseases. So cereal, the timing of introduction of cereals into the infant diet, depending on the timing, might influence the risk of celiac disease and also might influence the child's risk of getting type 1 diabetes. And really as an attempt to try to understand this. We can't easily manipulate the, the infant diet. So, so we turned to my colleague, Ovin, and, um, and uh, working with um, mouse models of this disorder, he started to, with his colleagues, started to manipulate diet and environment. And Govan, do you want to tell us what you've done? Sure, I would, uh, I would like, I'll be happy to. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge that the whole uh, our study was funded by uh, uh, grants from the Lee Iacocca Foundation, which we're, uh, we're very grateful to that funding. So as uh, you mentioned, uh, it's kind of hard to study the effect of diet and uh, the effect of uh, the interaction between celiac disease and diabetes in patients. So we thought we, uh, we can, uh, we'll be able to do the study uh, using, uh, using animal models of diabetes. So for this, uh, we use a mouse model called NOD mice. So these mice, they spontaneously develop diabetes. And uh, about 70% of the mice, they get diabetes without any uh, doing any manipulation. When you keep them on a, on a regular diet, uh, which contains wheat or, or gluten, they get about 70% of them, they get diabetes. So we thought it will be an interesting model to study. So what we did is that we removed the gluten or wheat from the diet. And then we, so we fed these mice a uh, gluten-free diet. So as I mentioned, uh, whereas uh, about 70% of the normal mice, NOD mice on a gluten-containing diet, when they develop diabetes, only 30% uh, only of the mice on a gluten-free diet, they develop diabetes. So this difference was striking, statistically highly significant. So this uh, clearly showed us that there is an effect of diet on the incidence of diabetes. Mm -hmm. 
uh, interestingly, these uh, observations have been made in uh, uh, kind of in other studies, but uh, what we wanted to go was to take the whole thing a step further and why and how the uh, amount of uh, wheat or gluten in the diet affects the incidence of diabetes. So uh, you might be aware that in, uh, in recent years, there has been a tremendous interest uh, in, uh, in the role of gut microflora on the incidence of diabetes. And uh, some studies have uh, they've kind of addressed the role of diet and the affecting the, affecting the, uh, the flora in the gut. So we thought uh, maybe that could be a relationship between uh, presence of wheat or gluten in the diet and whether it could change the microflora and whether in turn this could affect the overall incidence of diabetes. So, uh, so that's how uh, we, we did this project. And so you showed there were some differences in the microbiome, as it's called, in the, in the flora? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, we found a significant difference in the, the microbiome of uh, the mice which are fed a gluten-containing diet, which get high incidence of diabetes, versus uh, the microbiome of mice which have a low incidence of diabetes and which were uh, fed on a, a gluten-free diet. So this difference was, uh, again, statistically significant. Mm -hmm. And uh, so again, with the help of uh, some other collaborators, uh, we were able to further identify what are the actual, uh, how do the microbiome differ between the two, uh, between the two groups of mice. Mm -hmm. We found that certain bacterial species were enriched in mice which were fed uh, high uh, incidence, uh, uh, high incidence of diet Mm -hmm. Whereas mice, which were fed uh, a diet which is free of gluten, so there mm -hmm. is a significant difference in the microbiome. Between those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, to again, uh, again, uh, being in research, so again, we wanted to prove that it is actually the gluten which again it causes uh, this effect. So, what we did was that we added back gluten to that gluten free diet. Mm -hmm. So, and then we were, so now the, uh, the mice which normally now which got low incidence of diabetes because they were fed on a gluten-free diet, when you add back gluten, then they start getting a high incidence of diabetes. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we again analyze the microflora uh, or, uh, or the microbiome of those mice, now this microbiome was again different and mm -hmm. it was similar to the one in not mice which have a high incidence of diabetes, mm -hmm. which again proves that it is the gluten in the diet which could change the, which caused the change in microbiome, mm -hmm. which probably, uh, which resulted in, uh, in the low incidence of diabetes. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you have, have the similar uh, studies in any human patients? Or, uh? um, I think it's hard to know. We know in celiac disease that we've now started to appreciate that the bugs matter. And the bugs probably at the time that the person first sees gluten matters, in that we think of the bugs within the gut as having a, we use the term tolerogenic. Their job is to help our bodies recognize and tolerate foreign substances that we see. And that's a whole major function of our microbiome. Another function of our microbiome is to stimulate our immune system. So some bugs could stimulate our immune system, which might be bad when we come to autoimmunity, or bugs that produce tolerance that are good for us in some way, help us tolerate the things we should tolerate around us. Well, it's interesting, like uh, you're talking about the immune system and stuff, mm -hmm. I think it would be hard to do those studies in uh, human patients. Oh yes, it, it's but, very difficult. We do try to manipulate sometimes the microbiome in humans, but it's really not practical. At least right now it's not practical in infants to do that. Yeah. And I think there is a, a kind of an increasing awareness that what we eat is not just affecting us but it's what we are feeding our own bugs affects our bugs. And I think that's where your study seems to suggest that taking gluten out changes the bugs. And mm -hmm. maybe that change could be what's contributing to protection from diabetes, mm -hmm. especially this type 1 diabetes that occurs. Yeah, exactly. Yogesh, um, how do you think this um, information would um, or could help you know, the scientists in the field of type 1 diabetes? or should it, you know, direct our attention to a particular time of life, for example? Yeah, that's a good question, Joe. So, um, um, 
uh, you had earlier mentioned about diet early in life and the impact of that on celiac disease and on type 1 diabetes. So I think uh, we, we should probably use this information and, uh, and think about studies we could do in families that have mm -hmm. predispositions to type 1 diabetes and celiac disease um, and see the impact. Mm -hmm. um, I would think that would be the next step. I don't know that there are any pilot studies addressing mm -hmm. this particular cohort. Mm -hmm. I would think that families enriched for both disorders mm -hmm. would be the mm -hmm. families we should focus. I know you have cohorts and I mm -hmm. know there are other such cohorts mm -hmm. in the country so do you think, what do you think? Well, I think, um, I mean, one area we're especially interested in right now, and you and I have a, a clinical study, is for patients with newly diagnosed or recently diagnosed diabetes to try and look at the intestine. If, if these bugs are having an effect, it's probably through the intestine. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to look at the intestine of people who've been recently diagnosed to see if there are some markers. And we've just recently got funding from the JDRF to undertake such a study with collaboration from Harvard and the University of Chicago to, to look at the intestine of um, recently diagnosed type 1 diabetics. And we're hoping that that will give us some signal of something that happened to the immune system at triggering. Ultimately, uh, I think I would hope that if we can figure out what triggers immune, autoimmune disease and the role of the bacteria, maybe we can modify diet, for example, or even modify the bugs in some way that would reduce that risk, especially in those people like the family members or those we are we know are already at increased risk. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's a great idea. And again, uh, uh, me being a researcher, I would uh, maybe all the things, whatever you find in patients, or we can verify and we can study, do those mechanistic mm -hmm. studies in animal models, which, mm -hmm. is, which would be a lot easier to do. And then again, you can take it back again to the clinic mm -hmm. and see whether those, uh, uh, if you in interfere with certain pathogenic pathways, whether it can prevent or cure either celiac disease or type 1 diabetes. So that, that way, our interaction between the basic research and your mm -hmm. patient studies will be uh, highly effective and will be very mm -hmm. uh, useful. Do you think um, that this, uh, this, this research um, provides us any insight into why there's an increase, such an increase in the type 1 diabetes? Um, yeah, I think it, it's an interesting question, Joe, and it, it, it perhaps has got some bearing on the development of autoimmunity. Mm -hmm. I think recently I was uh, struck by hearing about how uh, even though the gut microbiome seems to change with time, mm -hmm. the um, uh, in infancy, for example, certain immune system biologies seem to change much mm -hmm. more slowly. Um, so, uh, so change in diet interventions mm -hmm. and change in the microbiome and change in the immune system. Mm -hmm. I think these multiple things need mm -hmm. to be addressed together. I think the other thing worth noting is that. We probably are seeing a change. We are seeing an increase in type one diabetes. Mm -hmm. We are probably also seeing a change in the epidemiology of type one diabetes and mm -hmm. the genetics, probably. So families that have type one diabetes, especially if the mother has type one diabetes, mm -hmm. have much smaller size families because mm -hmm. pregnancies in type one mm -hmm. are difficult to mm -hmm. carry through successfully. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the non the, the HLAs that we don't usually associate mm -hmm. with autoimmunity and type 1 diabetes, we are seeing an increase in the mm -hmm. number of immune-mediated diseases. So, so, so the, the people who we would have thought were at low risk for type 1 diabetes because they didn't have the usual genes, right. they are now getting type 1 diabetes. Right. Right. Because one thing that has stayed stable in the last 40 years at least is in a population Type 1 diabetes is diagnosed for the first time in a family every year, 80% of the time. Mm -hmm. So every, in Olmsted County, if we have 15 patients per 100,000 being diagnosed with type mm -hmm. 1, mm -hmm. 12 out of these 15 are occurring in families that never had, had type, type 1. 1 before. Mm -hmm. And that has not changed in the last 40 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. So three uh, are happening in families with a family history. So these new ones are happening in 
an entirely new family. In, in a new family. And we're suggesting it may be environmental, there's a strong environmental influence. Yes. So the other thing I think I was thinking about during this conversation is, as Govin said, you know, you change your chow, you change the microbiome, but then how does the microbiome lead to the next events? And what are the pathways there? And could those be other areas mm -hmm. for intervention? Mm -hmm. After all, diet changes things, but are there other mm -hmm. downstream mm -hmm. events? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's a big science behind oh, yes. yeah. it. The next project. Yeah. Next yeah. project. Yeah. Right.